Okay, thank you, um, Lynn. Uh, what I'll tell you with respect to the Washington Capitals, actually the uh, assistant general manager, Ross Mahoney of the Capitals, uh, was, used to be my teacher and coach uh, in Canada. So, so there you go. <clears throat> um, so uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to tell you about some of the research that we've been involved in over the last um, several years. And um, full disclosure, I am Canadian. And, um, but I work in the United States, there you go. Uh, but I work in the United States and um, I was born and raised in Saskatchewan and I did my doctorate degree at the University of Toronto. And I've been at the University of California in San Francisco as faculty member over the last uh, 12 years. And to be perfectly honest with you, I often think about going back to Canada um, over the years <laughs> for a, a myriad of reasons, including more recently political ones. But uh, the simple fact is uh, I can't do the work that I'm doing in the United States or in the Bay Area in Canada, at least not to the same scale, or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So we're very lucky, our biomedical researchers are very lucky to be living and working in the United States because it is the best place uh, to do uh, research. And one of the reasons it's the best place is because it's had an open arms policy for accepting people, the best and the brightest, from all over the world. And here's hoping that that policy uh, uh, continues. Um, and the other thing I would like to say is that as scientists, we often complain about the level of funding from NIH, but relatively speaking, um, it's not bad if you compare the United States to other countries. However, that being said, I think now is a critical point to invest more money into biomedical research. I would argue we're at an inflection point um, with the kind of technologies I'm going to be talking about today to help us understand disease and ultimately then try to treat and even uh, uh, prevent it. So the title of my talk here today is Breaking Down Sci Scientific Silos, Identifying Commonalities Across Disease. And one of the problems I have with science is that it's siloed. And if you look at campuses, at universities or academic institutions, you'll see, all right, there's the cancer center on one end of the campus. Then you have the Center for Neurodegenerative D Disease Research on the other end. Then you have the Institute for Infectious Disease. It's siloed. It's siloed at Big Pharma. You have different uh, departments. It's the oncology department that's separated from the neuro department. And it's siloed here at NIH, too, in my opinion, uh, quite badly. If you look at the different institutes, you have the National Cancer Institute, you have the National Institute for AIDS and Infectious Disease, you have the National Institute of Mental Health. And it'd be very advantageous to make connections uh, across these different silos at every single level um, in terms of uh, coming up with uh, novel uh, treatments as we go from uh, ultimately to, from disease uh, to disease. So the thesis here of my talk is as follows that unbiased science is revealing that there are remarkable connections between many different disease areas, including cancer, many types of cancers, neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and neuropsychiatric disorders uh, as well, including autism and schizophrenia, as well as infectious disease and many other diseases um, as well. So uh, we're realizing that there's these connections across these different disease areas. And um, how are we recognizing this? How, how have we discovered this? Well, by essentially mapping cells. So I really look at myself as a map maker. And instead of mapping different regions um, on the planet, we're actually mapping the molecular architecture of different cells, looking at the connections between the different biological entities that exist in cells, genes, and proteins. And I think it's very analogous to a printed map of different cities. Of course, we don't have printed maps anymore. This is analogous to the GPSs um, uh, on our phone. But I think it's a very good analogy to use. And if you understand the map of a city, you can more easily navigate that city and get to where you want to go. OK, so just to take a few steps back here to tell you about some of the motivation behind these mapping approaches before I get into them. So in 2001, uh, the first human, human genome was, was published. There was actually two papers, one from a private uh, entity and one from a more public-oriented entity, one led by Eric Lander, one led by Craig Venter. And at the time, it cost $150 million to sequence a single genome. Now, I think it costs a couple hundred dollars. And pretty soon, we'll just be going to the doctor's office, and one of the routine tests we're going to be getting is just simply having our, a, a complete genome sequenced. And the question is, what do we do with all this information? So, you know, about 20 years ago, I think the thought was the 
uh, naive thought was that all right, it would be sequencing sets of individuals afflicted with the same disease and finding the one mutation that's responsible for that disease. And the challenge then would be for the scientists to come up with the strategy to overcome the detrimental effects of that specific mutation so that we can help uh, treat or even cure that disease. So this idea of one disease, one gene, one mutation did come to fruition with respect to a couple of disease areas. And what I'm showing you here uh, at the bottom, it's called a Manhattan plot um, because it's supposed to represent these you know, skyscrapers, where on the x-axis here, you have the different genes that are in our genome. And on the y-axis, we're looking to see if there's any enrichment of specific mutations when we look at a specific disease area. So as I said, this one gene, one mutation, one disease uh, kind of flow does apply to a couple of disease areas, such as cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and Huntington's disease. There's one specific mutation in our genome that can result in these different uh, uh, disease states. However, it became fastly realized that most diseases were multigenic, i.e., there were many different mutations, dozens and sometimes even hundreds, that were contributing to these uh, different disease states. So the question is, what do you do with this long list of genes? And this, therefore, is your much more typical Manhattan plot, where you have these peaks here along the way in blue, green, and orange. Each one look interesting, but none of them are considered statistically significant in that they do not go above this particular dotted line. So we got these lists of genes, not just single genes, and the question is, how do we make sense of these lists of genes. Sometimes there's hundreds of genes that are mutated, uh, especially when you're looking at different cancers. How do you interpret this information? So the vision here is really to use networks, to use maps to help interpret these mutations. So here's just a toy map, a toy network, uh, where each circle here just could correspond to a different gene. And then the lines between the circles could correspond to connections between the genes. It's saying these genes are working together. And if these particular genes up here, these peaks up here, correspond to individual genes on this network, I think you'd agree with me that this particular network would make this genomic data much more interpretable. So instead of just individual genes that are being mutated and maybe functioning independently, this is saying that they're actually connected and they're functioning together. So we can interpret this as a, maybe one unit that's ultimately being mutated. And I would argue that we don't need Manhattan plots of individual genes. What we need are Manhattan plots of individual networks. And then you'd say, ah, these three genes are in this one network. Now this becomes statistically significant. And this is the network of genes that we should be uh, focusing on. But the sad fact is we don't have the networks uh, in the vast majority of cells, in, in, in healthy cells or disease cells. So this is where we come in, in terms of uh, generating these maps. And to talk a little bit more about um, how we generate these maps and the specific uh, biological entities we're looking at. This is just some biology 101 for you. So each cell in us has uh, DNA corresponding to 20,000, uh, approximately 20,000 different genes. And for the most part, one gene codes for one protein. So in each one of our cells, potentially there's 20,000 different proteins. And you can think of the proteins as the functional units of our cell. These are the building blocks of the cell. They carry out our functions that make the, the, the cells uh, be healthy and ultimately us be healthy as well. And oftentimes, these proteins talk to other proteins. They physically associate with uh, a sets of proteins. Um, and you can think of these as groups of proteins or protein complexes over here on the far right. And it's been estimated that there are several thousand protein complexes in each one of our cells. And you can think of these complexes as the molecular machines of the cell. These complexes come together to uh, provide us with organelles in the cell. So just some uh, biology 101 here, some high school biology to, to form the nucleus. Here's the endoplasmic reticulum and then the mitochondria. So then these cells come together and make organs and then the organs obviously come together to make us. So one of the key parts of our mapping is focusing on these proteins and how they talk to one another, okay? So that's what I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of my talk today is the mapping in terms of looking at the proteins that are linked to different disease areas and how they talk to one another. All right, so now back to our toy network here. Um, so this is really one small network of many networks that exist in the cell. And um, you can see here, this is probably one out of thousands of different networks, so it becomes incredibly complicated uh, when you look at a cell in this manner. But again, as I said before, I think the maps of the cell are very analogous to maps 
of different cities. So for example, here's a, uh, the city we're all in um, uh, right now. And what can happen, as you all are well aware of, is that you can get congestion, traffic congestion, right? So you could have a car breakdown and you could have an accident at different parts of the city. And what this results in is congestion. You get problems uh, at different parts of the map. So you could be up in the top right-hand corner, but you don't know where the accident was. Uh, it, it could be close to you, it could be further away. Um, at a number of different spots of the map. So to me, conceptually, this is very similar to looking at molecular maps of the cell. You have these maps in healthy situations. This is what we generate. Then we introduce the mutations associated with different disease areas to help us understand what's happening at a molecular level. And you can think of them as mutations for disease areas or infections. There's uh, infectious uh, um, uh, proteins that come in us from different viruses that come in and attack different parts of the map. So if you had this reference map, you can then interpret more effectively the different mutations associated with different disease areas and how different pathogenic proteins come in and hijack and, and rewire our cells. And ultimately, this will lead, I would argue, to more uh, powerful uh, targeted therapies uh, for these different disease areas. Okay, so this mapping can be done on any cell type. Um, on any set of genes, so there's a lot of work to be done here. So what we've decided to do is to focus our attention on different disease areas. And uh, we have three different mapping initiatives that Lynn alluded to in my introduction that I'd like to briefly go through with you. Uh, the first one here is the Cancer Cell Map Initiative. Uh, this is uh, uh, involving uh, scientists at UCSF and UCSD, and it was founded with a good friend of mine, Trey Eidecker, who's pictured there, who's the chief of genetics at um, uh, UCSD. And uh, the idea here is that we're taking the sets of mutations that are associated with these large-scale sequencing projects. They're just systematically sequencing cancer tumors, finding sets of mutations associated with different cancers. We're just unbiasedly looking at all the patients that they have sequenced and focusing our attention on the genes that are most mutated and subjecting them to these type of mapping approaches uh, that I'm alluding to. And this does two things, right? First, it allows us to be uh, more predictive with respect to prognosis and with which drugs should be used for which patients. So these maps are very powerful in that way. And secondarily, this is longer term, but I think much more exciting, it's identifying new targets where we could come in with new therapeutics uh, to ultimately help uh, uh, fight these different uh, uh, cancers. And we're starting with breast cancer and head and neck cancer uh, right now, and then we're extending to other cancers um, as well. So that's one mapping initiative. Uh, a second one is the one here in the bottom left-hand corner called the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative. This is a more recently formed initiative uh, at UCSF, and I have pictured here Matt State, the chair of psychiatry. He recently gave one of these lectures in this forum, I think about a year ago. Um, and also pictured there is Jeremy Wilsley, who works in the Department of Psychiatry. He's a, a good Canadian boy at, uh, at UCSF. And these individuals here are experts at uh, looking at genetic information from autistic children and identifying genes that when are mutated are linked to autism. And they've recently identified about 60, 65 genes that are linked to autism. There's about 12 to 14 genes that are strongly linked to schizophrenia now. Five genes connected to Tourette syndrome. And there's more genes now bubbling up um, connecting to uh, anxiety and depression. But we know absolutely nothing, virtually nothing, about the underlying biology, especially at the MAP level, um, looking at these different neuropsychiatric disorders. So I'm most excited actually about this particular area in terms of moving the needle in a short period of time, coming up with new biology which will ultimately lead to new therapeutics. And in some of these areas, there's no therapeutic option um, whatsoever. And then the third mapping initiative is uh, in the bottom right here is focused on infectious disease. And this is a collaboration between UCSF and UC Berkeley. Pictured there is Jeff Cox, faculty member at UC Berkeley. And he's the director of SEND, uh, which is the Center for Emerging and Neglected Disease um, at UC Berkeley. And what we're doing is using these mapping approaches to systematically look at many different pathogens, both viruses and bacteria, uh, studying how they come in and affect our maps and, and how they come in and hijack and rewire our maps to, so they can optimally, optimally infect uh, our cells. And what I say is that these mapping initiatives are, are being funded by centers, uh, NIH-funded centers. Um, we have two for the host pathogen mapping initiative. Um, this is from NIAID. Um, this, the cancer cell map initiative is being funded by NCI. 
And we've recently got a center grant on the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative from the National Institute of um, uh, Mental Health. Um, that's uh, just recently started. But one of the messages here of this talk is there's, uh, which I'll get to at the end, is that there's great value going across these different uh, mapping initiatives because we're seeing these amazing uh, commonalities. And that's uh, really the message, of, one of the major messages of my talks here um, uh, today. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit of our work with respect to looking at maps, looking at different infectious agents, both viruses and bacteria. I know I'm showing a lot here, but you don't have to obviously get into all the details. Um, but what we're doing with these maps is looking at uh, the, the, the viral and the bacterial proteins and which human proteins they're interacting with. So some of these viruses have only like 10 genes or 15 genes. We have 20,000 genes. So the viruses can exist by themselves. They need to exist within us um, in order to optimally infect uh, our cells. So they need our machinery in order to infect us. So it'd be very advantageous to know which human proteins, the viral proteins, are physically uh, uh, talking to. So we've looked at a number of different uh, pathogens. You have HPV up there. HPV is obviously connected to head and neck cancer and cervical cancer. Um, we have herpes virus. Uh, we have a large program on influenza. You have hepatitis C and hepatitis B. This is connected to liver cancer. And then we have viruses such as dengue and Zika as well. But I would argue the most well-studied virus of all time, if you look at how much money NIH has put into it, is HIV. And this is what I want to focus a little bit more attention on, is how we're extracting information from this particular map. And again, there's a lot of details here that, that, that don't matter, but just to point out that these yellow nodes here, or these yellow uh, circles are the HIV proteins, and then the other circles correspond to different human proteins that they attack during the course of infection. And just to make the point here that HIV, although many people think it's cured, it is not, it's still hugely problematic um, around the world. There's 37 million people and counting that are infected um, in, in the areas of the world where it's incredibly problematic, still is in Africa. It's amazing when you visit some of these um, African countries, the uh, HIV and infection rates are incredibly high. However, there are uh, drugs that are available. A number of them are listed here, um, but they're expensive and they often cause side effects. So we still need to come up, in my opinion, with new therapies to help fight off HIV and other infectious agents um, as well. So just to tell you some of the stuff we can do with this map, we can go very deep to look at specific HIV proteins, which I'll illustrate here in the next couple of slides. So again, the, the, the names here don't matter so much, but just to tell you, in this particular kind of simplistic network, we have one protein from HIV, one out of the 15, it's called TAT, and we see it talking to three other human proteins. Presumably it's doing something to these proteins to make it advantageous for HIV and detrimental for the host. So this is a very low resolution picture of these proteins, but what we have at our disposal now are incredibly powerful microscopes where we can look at these proteins and these protein complexes and get much more higher resolution information behind them. Um, this is a, 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 a cryo-EM, electron microscopy. Um, this approach is, is really revolutionizing biomedical research, in my opinion. The Nobel Prize was awarded for the people that ultimately uh, had developed this particular uh, approach to look at proteins. Um, and just to give you a sense of what these costs, where the NIH money is going, this is tens of millions of dollars, this one particular microscope. My fantasy would be to have like 100 of them lined up and us looking just systematically at all these proteins, but we'll start with one, I guess, microscope. Um, but it's incredibly powerful because it can take this very simplistic view of these four proteins and give us much higher resolution information. And this is really what it looks like in us, okay? The, the HIV protein, TAT, it's amazing because what it does, it inserts itself into a human protein complex and forces it to do something detrimental for us and beneficial for uh, uh, the virus. And now that you have this high resolution picture, this will lead to more intelligent targeted drug design. Because you could say, oh, maybe there's a little pocket here we could design a drug for that could come in and interrupt the, the function of this hijacked uh, complex. So having these pictures, these high resolution pictures of these proteins is incredibly powerful uh, in terms of coming up with new therapies. So we can take these maps and go very deep but we can also take a few steps back and try to connect this information to patients, people that are actually infected with HIV. And to do this, we've been collaborating with Steve Olinsky. Uh, he's at Northwestern, he's a very interesting uh, man. Um, he was at the uh, epicenter of the AIDS epidemic uh, in Chicago in the 80s, and he's been in charge of this MAX 
this multi-center AIDS cohort study. So for a few decades now, he's essentially been monitoring a large number of people, several thousand individuals, monitoring how sensitive or resistant they are to HIV. So in, in this large group, he's identified 220 individuals which are classified as highly exposed seronegatives. These are individuals that have been incredibly sexually promiscuous for long periods of time, constantly exposed to the virus, yet they don't get infected. They're resistant to HIV. And the question is, well, why? What's the genetic cause for that? So what, are there mutations in these individuals that are, 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 are resulting in this resistance? Oftentimes you think as mutations as bad. Well, yeah, mutations sometimes can be good. They can make you resistant to different disease states like HIV. So what we did using our map, we looked at all the genes, there's about 400 of them here, and we looked at the corresponding genes in these individuals and we sequenced them trying to find mutations in those genes that would help explain for resistance to HIV. And we found one, very excitingly, that we could map to this structure. It's this one particular mutation. It's in this blue protein here, actually. And it's very exciting because it looks like it's directly touching the HIV protein that's called TAT. So we think that this particular mutation could have therapeutic value. If we could introduce this mutation into all of us, we could essentially make us resistant to HIV. So how can we do this? Well, I think most of you have probably heard about CRISPR DNA editing. Uh, it's only been around for a few years, but uh, it, it also is having a huge impact on uh, biomedical uh, research. And there's a number of people involved in, in you know, discovering and implementing CRISPR, uh, including uh, one of the CRISPR pioneers, Jennifer Doudna, who's at UC Berkeley, who is intimately involved in all these mapping initiatives that I'm talking about. So just at a really high level, what CRISPR allows you to do is to come in, you can think of it as scissors, and it can change specific bases in our DNA. It can mutate out bad uh, mutations and make good uh, uh, DNA come in there, uh, individual uh, bases of the DNA. It can delete regions of DNA that could be problematic. It can also incorporate in pieces of genes or entire genes into our genome if we deem that to be um, ultimately uh, beneficial. So it's an incredibly powerful uh, genomic engineering technique that's having an impact across all of science right now. All right, so how do we use this uh, approach? So we could take individuals, and we have actually done this, uh, people, uh, healthy people, uninfected people, and we're taking their blood, and we're taking the T cells from their bloods. The T cells are the cells in our body that HIV uh, uh, optimally infects. And what we're doing is using CRISPR to put in this one specific mutation into these cells and ultimately making these cells resistant to HIV, which is incredibly exciting. Now the next big step is trying to take these cells and introduce them back into the individual where we got these cells from and let them grow and propagate and, and, and ultimately make this individual uh, resistant to HIV. There's still a big step here. We can do this, all of this, but there's still a big step here uh, on how to do this most uh, effectively, but it will come. And this is another reason why we need more HI fun NIH funding right now to help us with this uh, next um, uh, crucial step. And this applies not just to HIV. We have programs in influenza. We have mutations we've identified that make people resistant to flu. We could do the same thing looking at flu. We could do the same thing if there's specific mutations that help people be resistant to cancer. We can do the same thing here. So to me, this is a, 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 one of the next big areas of, of science is, is genetically manipulating our own cells using CRISPR, getting them back into us and helping us uh, fight off disease and even better prevent the disease in the first place. So I have one more example of, of uh, how these maps are useful. That's one example that I just showed you. And um, hopefully I'm not overloading you with maps. I probably am. But um, this is a, one last example uh, illustrating the power of going across different disease areas. This is a point I made at the, the start of my talk, finding commonalities which could have a in, big impact with respect to treatment. And it has to do with our work on dengue and Zika. Um, as global warming progresses, these are viruses that are going to be more prevalent, moving from the south up into the north and into the United States and then Canada eventually. Um, so we need to be looking at these in more detail. And dengue exists in humans and in mosquitoes. That's what mosquitoes transfer the, the, the virus to us. So we can generate these type of maps in both human cells and mosquito cells. And this is what we've done here with dengue. We've looked at human cells and mosquito cells. And Zika, we've just looked at uh, human cells at the top. And one of the things we're doing is looking, as I said, for these commonalities 
human proteins that come up in all three maps, and we found one very interesting connection here between one Dengue Zika protein, which is called NS4 at the bottom, and these other human proteins. And these proteins, which I won't go into detail, but just to tell you, they're very key proteins in the cell. They get mutated and cause cancer. These mutations cause cancer. And there's actually a, a good friend of mine just down the hall at UCSF. His name is Jack Taunton. He's a chemist. And he actually developed drugs which attack these proteins in a cancer situation. Okay, there's anti-cancer drugs. He's actually started a company with these drugs. It's in a clinical trial, I think uh, phase two, uh, looking at prostate cancer. Well, we found these same proteins coming out of our dengue and Zika map. So the hypothesis here is that maybe these anti-cancer drugs could be killing off dengue and Zika as well. And when we look in human cells after we've infected them with dengue and Zika, we can see, and in mosquito cells, we completely can kill uh, the virus. And the toxicity has already been worked out because it's already been worked out in the, in the context of this clinical trial, which is focused on cancer. So now the question is maybe there's value here of these drugs, just as much value, and maybe even more value to fight off uh, dengue and Zika. And there's these mouse models, which you can infect dengue and Zika with. We have collaborators in New York, and we're, um, we've infected them with dengue and Zika, and then we're feeding them pellets that have this drug to see if we can kill uh, infection in um, a mouse with the ultimate goal of trying to get to human cells um, to kill off dengue and Zika as well. So how great would it be if you took one drug that could help with cancer and fight off dengue um, uh, and Zika? And I think this is a very nice example of going across these disease areas and finding these, these commonalities. And we're seeing more and more of these as we look um, at these uh, different maps. And so I'll just come back to my initial comment uh, that I had at the beginning of my presentation. And I'll add one more comment that NIH should fund more collaborative silo-breaking science to identify and convert these uh, discoveries, these commonalities, into cures and even preventions um, for disease. Because it's the same genes being mutated in cancer that are being hijacked by HIV. It's the same genes being mutated in autism that are being hijacked by Zika. So maybe there's a treatment for one of these diseases that could be as effective, even more effective on another disease, or at the very least knowledge on one disease that could be applied to many other uh, uh, disease areas um, in, uh, in the future. Um, so this is a, a big uh, a push of where we're headed right now in terms of looking across these different disease areas and breaking down these silos. And this is the last slide I have, talking about the silos here at NIH. Um, I have to say thank you to NIH for funding us for all these things. But what would be great, though, is to try to make connections uh, between these silos, because there'd be great advantages to do that, not just at NIH, but at Big Pharma and at academic institutes um, uh, like UCSF, like the one um, uh, I work at. And I would argue that these mapping approaches, generating these maps of the cell is a very powerful way to make these connections between these different silos. And I truly believe that the biggest discoveries occur when you get together people that don't normally work together. And I think this is a perfect example uh, of that. And I'm very excited to be going in this particular direction in the future. So I'll end here. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions about any, anything I talked about here today. Well, I think in, in the context of these cell mapping initiatives, what we're trying to do is, is kind of exactly what you're alluding to. So each one of these centers that we get from NIH include between 10 and 14 scientists. So in the context of that psychiatric cell map initiative, which has recently gotten funded from the National Institute of Mental Health, we have, I think, 12 or 13 investigators. It includes people like me. I, they call me a systems biologist because I globally look at different systems. They have computational computer scientists uh, we have on that team, and then we also have psychiatrists. So, you know, psychiatrists and someone like me, we should not be working together, right? But, but that's where the big discoveries will ultimately be coming. So these large collaborative grants that NIH supplies, I think, are fantastic mechanisms 
for bringing people together. And you know, one of the main messages I have is we need more of those. We need to force people together. We need to force the, the MDs and the clinical people together with the basic researchers. That's one force. Another force, as you say, is genetic cell biologists. That's another one. And then another one is looking across different disease areas, getting people to work that work on cancer and autism, getting them talking. And again, these, these maps that we're generating allow not just connections between genes and proteins, but facilitate connections between the different scientists focused on the different disease areas. So it, it's a challenge, as you rightly point out, but I think we're headed in the right uh, direction. Hi, much less global question. Um, do you see these, I'm just thinking about the HIV one, um, as therapies or potentially sort of as a vaccine? This, it's a very good question. I mean, these discoveries that I'm going through um, ultimately could be used for either. Um, so, um, the, the more you understand about the interworkings of the cell and how HIV infects us, the more it can inform uh, different therapies, either that be a drug, someone who has HIV, or a vaccine for someone um, uh, uh, who doesn't. So uh, I see these discoveries um, helping across uh, uh, the board. The idea of, of using CRISPR to do genetic manipulation in cells um, and then reintroducing those cells, that's kind of like a vaccine, that's a preventative measure, and in, 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 you know, that's trying to prevent infection. Um, I truly believe that that is going to come to fruition soon, but it's a slippery slope in terms of, you know, what mutations you want to introduce. And you can introduce these mutations at the embryonic stage as well. Um, that's possible. And then the question becomes as well, maybe at the onset of life, we introduce in 10 mutations that make you resistant to 10 different disease states. And that sounds great, but then we don't know the connections between those mutations, and that could be something even more detrimental than than the disease itself. So there's a lot of ethical considerations in, in, in carrying out uh, these type of experiments. And uh, there's a lot of people, smart people looking into this to make sure we adhere to these ethical considerations. I'd like to follow up on sure. that question. The way. If one way would be to study people over the next hundred years to see what having that Well, that is the best genetic experiment, which you just alluded to, and um, uh, unfortunately, we won't be alive to see some of those results. Uh, but in a way, uh, that cohort that I alluded to, which identified the HIV-resistant individuals, it was kind of that experiment. And it, they'd just been following them for 30, you know, 35 years, so not thousands of years, which would be the, the optimal way to do it. But these are individuals um, that are resistant but are otherwise healthy. Okay, so these, this specific mutation then is uh, uh, not having a detrimental effect in any other aspect of their life, but it's having one positive, and that's making them resistant to HIV. So the, the best would be to be, look at over thousands of years, and the prediction would be that mutation would be selected for, and ultimately we'd all just become resistant to HIV. I think this probably will happen, but not obviously in our lifetime. Um, but studying these uh, sets of individuals that are resistant to different diseases is a very powerful way to come up with potential therapies then to ultimately give uh, the people who don't have that mutation resistance to, to the different disease states. And we, we do that in a variety of different ways. So it's always trying to connect back to the patient uh, and, 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 and getting the patient information to inform our studies. Yes? Um, what are the biggest challenges facing the moot in Shiloh area? Is it just a lack of funding? Is it a stigma? There's, there's a number. That's, yeah, it's, that's another great question. I think many things, uh, I'll, uh, lack of funding is one, I'll say that. But the other thing is the way academics is set up, okay, it rewards the individual. Who wins the Nobel Prize? One person. So it, it makes people, or three people, or whatever, it's, who wins the big awards? It's individual scientists. How do you get tenure? Okay, what did you do? I don't, if you did it in a large group, this, what did you do? How do you get grants? Like, what did you do? And oftentimes for younger investigators, it's hard to get involved in these larger collaborative multidisciplinary uh, types of ways of doing science, which I think are the groundbreaking ways to do science. So it's the way the system is set up. It selects against individuals, especially younger scientists, to get involved in these uh, kind of larger collaborative efforts, which I think are so key. And ultimately to making cures. So I think that has to be changed. I don't know, how, you know that's, that's ingrained in, in our system. That's very hard. Um, but providing money specifically 
for silo breaking efforts um, and maybe a tune for younger scientists as well in that context, We're trying to protect the younger scientists and encourage them to be involved in these, uh, these larger initiatives. So to me, I think those are the two major areas uh, which could uh, uh, definitely help. The first one, it's harder to do something with. The second one, it's a little bit easier to do. If you guys can help. Yes. Yeah, that's also a very good point. I mean, all the all the mapping I'm talking about um, to date is 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 static, is um, normal, I guess, normal mapping. But what we could do is introduce stresses onto the cells and then remap the cells. Okay, so uh, DNA damaging agents that we're all exposed to. Well, we can generate these maps in the context of those to get an idea of how you know, different con environmental conditions are having an impact on, on the cause of disease. So I see these as kind of, it's kind of the foundation, these kind of no condition maps, but then we can start to put on other conditions, um, other stresses, uh, environmental stresses, to see how the map gets rewired. And I think that'll be incredibly informative um, to help us uh, inform us on how environmental conditions ultimately uh, contribute to different disease states, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, I just wondered, um, earlier this year there was this, you know, does CRISPR cause cancer here? Um, and I was wondering where that is. I mean, there was, I think you're alluding to um, uh, the thought that um, the CRISPR has a lot of off-target effects. So you think you're going in and manipulating um, uh, one particular piece of the DNA, but it's going off and doing crazy other mutations that you're not w uh, aware of. Um, so that could have implications on uh, other diseases arising. As you're treating one disease, maybe other diseases arise. But um, I think the consensus in the field here from multiple groups is that is not as prevalent as was initially thought. So I, and in my opinion, that is not going to be a problem. CRISPR is incredibly precise. It's an incredibly precise tool um, that uh, will be brought to bear to treat many diseases in the future. That's my feeling. Yes. Yes, and, and the reason you could do that, as I alluded to one of my original slides, is one mutation. Right. And you just fix that, and if you can get that back in individuals, then you can cure the disease. But it becomes more problematic when you have dozens or hundreds of mutations, because you can't CRISPR all of these things at the same time. Any other questions? I just want to say I'm a, I'm, I'm a big Toronto Maple Leaf fan, so hopefully they win next year and not the Washington Capitals. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On a Canadian note, that's the way to end. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone.